right, if you do not know who I am, my name is Mark McKinley, and it's my delight this morning, part of the pastoral eldership team here at Seaburg. But I want to continue with 1 John, 1 John. So if you have your Bibles with you, when you turn to 1 John, uh, where are the mothers in the room? All the mothers. Last Sunday sounded amazing. Okay, for one of you it was, that's amazing. <laughs> And uh, it's so good. I know that Tammy is serving at Kids Rock, but uh, she apparently knocked it out the park. It was just outstanding. Uh, so happy Mother's Day for those who were in the room last Sunday. And for the rest of you, if you weren't here, that's fine. Series overview. John, this incredible writer, as we, we look at 1 John, and if you do not know, we this is sort of the fifth week in the 1 John series. Uh, I think it's been a great series thus far. But just to remind us that John writes a letter to a community just like this community. It's a community of people that, in a sense, were on, on rocky ground. Uh, they were, were losing their confidence and their trust in Jesus. And, and in a way, John is coming and he's encouraging these believers. He's coming in and leaning into you and I. And, and he's reminding us again and again to continue to stay fast to Christ, to remain steadfast to his word. He encourages them to keep walking faithfully, to keep serving Christ, and to continue to live in the fellowship of the local church. And so I trust that the overarching desire of this book, this letter to these people is one to say, hey church, would you remain steadfast? Would you continue to love Jesus? And would you continue to love each other? That's the heart of 1 John. And Don, two weeks, uh, Sundays ago, he continued with this, the, the, the topic of truth and lies. And as I reread something of that scripture, I landed at the end with these three words, which really helped tie in something of what Don was talking on, truth and lies, to something of what I want to talk on this morning. And these three words are abide in Him. Abide in Him. What an incredible instruction, as you will see, to abide in Him. It's like actually there is no greater place to find ourselves as Christians, maybe for you searching out the claims of Christ, I trust that this morning you would leave with a greater sense of the importance of abiding in Him. We start off this week's reading in a similar position as what Don left off last two weeks back. John the writer is desperately wanting to securely position his listeners, to securely position them in a place where they're not easily deceived, where they're not easily undone, where they're not easily sort of cast aside or, or find themselves alone, but actually they are positioned in a place of strength in the gospel. To drill down deeper, John opened up the, this next portion of scripture that we're about to read in a similar vein, but now his true fathering heart is on the table, and we're going to hear more about that. How many of us dads, as I relate as a dad, you sit with your children, and as much as you want to, in a kind way, in a gracious way, in a loving way, you want to give them some instruction. You want them to be obedient to what you're about to say, but you can't sort of hold it down on them. You're in a sense saying, hey, you know, this is a good idea, this is something that you should be doing. I recommend this, you know, all these great terms to help nudge your children towards good decisions. But yet ultimately in your heart, you'd love for them to obey you. A little bit of a murmur, some moms also. We want our kids to obey us. It's like one of these ones where you sit and you go, man, I think it would be really good if you, you know, if you... Um, if you, if you don't go out with that girl, she's trouble. But you don't say that. You're just like, my boy, I think you can do better. Mm. I think you can, you can just lift the bar a bit. Does she love Jesus? That's a good question, you know. 
but dad, I think I'm going to help her find Jesus. No. <laughs> you want your children ultimately to obey you. Why? Because as a parent, you look down the road and you can see something of what this could look like in a few years' time. And you say, ooh, she's no good. How do I help my boy? How do I help my son? Maybe it's your daughter. Just to go, How do I help her make decisions? How does she make these decisions? He make these decisions based on the fact that you desperately want them to obey you because you can see the end results. And I think in the same way, John is coming to these people and, and he's, he's desperate for them to obey him. He's desperate for them to be ones who come under his instruction under his leadership but yet in the fathering heart that he has he's not sort of placing them in a lecture room he's putting them around the dining room table and he's wanting to draw them closer and to instruct them why because this morning we're going to be touching on the subject of obedience and sin obedience and sin 1 John 2 verse 28 we start out and it says this and now, little children, abide in him. There's those three words. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. That's his heart right there. That we would stand with confidence and when Jesus comes, when he returns, we sang about that this morning, that we wouldn't shrink back. But yet there'd be a confidence to stand before him. There would be a confidence of who we are, the position that we find ourselves as children, we are able to stand before our Father. Verse 29, if you know that He is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of Him. John is instructing his listeners, these immature believers, to be obedient to this one instruction, to abide in Him. What, what is the importance of obedience? Why is obedience needed? I think we live in a culture where we want to do it our way. Frank, Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. We want to do it our way. We don't want to do it your way. We don't want to listen to you. Why? Because we want to kick against obedience we want our own independent way. We want to choose our own way. But yet we see from society to society, from generation to generation, it's amazing how society sort of gets unraveled because of their disobedience and their lure of sin. Obedience is needed. In fact, hearing and obeying were so closely related to the Hebrew language as they use it that ultimately it was the same thing. It conveyed the same, both ideas of hearing and obeying. These were two things that were married together for those in the Hebrew language. I remember my mom many times saying, what are those on the side of your head? Are they just ornaments? <laughs> Why? Because we grew up in a society, and we do grow up in a society where there's many that we would perceive as suggestions. This is a great suggestion, but you don't know. You don't know, Mom and Dad. I know. I know. What do you know? You've only lived 40, 50, 60 years. I've only lived 15 years. I know. Here, there's this desire to be reminding of us in the Hebrew language that as we hear something, as it is instructed to us, we obey it. It's interchangeable. It's something of the response. Even James Smart says that the verb, I love this, the verb to hear in Hebrew significantly denotes that any passive receiving of words into the mind, but response of a man's whole being. It doesn't just denote that there's a passive hearing of like, oh, that's a great idea. No, no, no. It means I stand up and I respond. My whole being sort of moves into action. This is the heart. This is the understanding that John is writing into. The expectation John has is that these little children would hear his instruction. Just to remind us that they weren't children. They were adults. 
but yet there was an immaturity around their faith. That these children would hear his instructions, obediently live out this instructions, so that they may be confident in Christ, practicing righteousness in their everyday life as one should, as a born again believer. John is fully aware that what he was calling his listeners to be obedient to could easily at any time be undermined by something that has been at work since the beginning, since the, the beginning of time. Something that would cause not just them, but you and I to shrink from him. As the scripture says, as he returns, as Jesus appears, don't shrink from him. Well, what would cause him to say this? Why would he encourage his readers to remain strong so that they wouldn't shrink back? Well, because he understands that sin is in play. He understands that the very thing that would cause you to, to be in shame and to sort of cower away is this, this, this notion that sin is still prevalent. And it's there to bring us to a place that exposes the shame on our lives. I don't know if you have come this morning with shame. Maybe you've come this morning and you've arrived today just, just under the weight of shame under the weight of insecurity, under the weight of sin, I trust that this morning you would be encouraged. Romans 5 verse 12 would remind us that every single one of us, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man, through Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. It's like in this moment, John is realizing that so quickly sin can belittle, so quickly sin can derail something of the confidence, of the assurance that these people were living in. And he needs to identify it. He needs to put it out there. And he needs to say, hey, even though sin would come to bring a weight of shame and guilt upon you, I want to put it out there and, and give you a clarity of why we can in confidence stand secure in these moments. You see, the doctrine of sin is, is a central concept to the Christian faith. Sin was conceived of as being fundamentally disobedient to God. That's where this thing, this, this topic of obedience is so important. Why? Because the very notion of sin is, is counter that. It, it disobeys God. Man's individual action that goes against God. Ultimately, all sin is a positive rebellion against God and a transgression of His righteous standards. That's what sin is. That's what sin is. It's a weightiness of brokenness. It's a weightiness where even Dale van Dyck says, every wicked thought, word, and deed flows from a foul fountain of evil within us. We are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. So there's this weightiness of obedience. John is encouraging his people just to say, man, you, you need to be obedient to remain steadfast so when his return is imminent, we're able to stand with confidence before him. But he's so aware that there's shame and insecurity that sin, which has been in operation right from the beginning of time till now, is still there. And he needs to highlight it and, and, and recognize that ultimately this thing of sin isn't something exclusively to some people. It is there in the fiber and the DNA of humanity. John is calling his listeners back to a discipline of obedience. Obedience of posture that keeps them abiding in Him, which produces confidence. Abiding in Him, which produces, produces righteousness. So the remaining 10 verses, as we will read, highlight two key, key biblical truths that require our obedience to overcome sin's destruction. So let's continue. Number one, number one. Knowing that I am a child of God changes everything. We require obedience, and there's the sin that is knocking at our door. How do we overcome these? How do we give ourselves to the obedience of truth to overcome something of the sin? 
Well, the first one is this. Knowing that I am a child of God changes everything. Number, verse 1 in 1 John 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, amazingly, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. Because of His love for us, we are called children of God. We are called children of God. These are two uniquely different portions of Scripture. The first one is saying, when He appears, be careful that we don't have to be cowering in shame. And the second one here is saying, actually, when He appears, we're able to stand secure because we're children of God. The most powerful demonstration of this picture of being chosen as a son and a daughter of the Most High is seen through the act of adoption. The beauty of this moment where a mom and a dad would arrive at the adoption center and there would be children there. And I can just imagine as the father and the mother look around, they realize that they are going to leave with a child. They, they're going to have one of these as their own. And it's in that moment where they look upon a child and they say, I choose you. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being that child? Can you imagine being someone who sees for the first time someone who has reached out to choose you, to say, I choose you. I choose you. Above everyone else in this room, I choose you. You see, when our kids came, you got what you got. <laughs> and we are so thankful. But in the moments of adoption, you are chosen. That's why the picture of adoption is so beautiful, because I don't deserve it. I don't deserve to be chosen. I don't deserve to be picked out of the crowd. But yet God comes and He says, I choose you. You will be mine. In that one moment, in that one moment, you move from not being wanted, potentially living with rejection and betrayal, neglection, to a place of belonging. You're now part of a family. In an instant, you're part of a community. You're part of maybe there's some other siblings. You may be part of something greater, but in a moment, because of this incredible picture of adoption, where it is nothing that you have done, but it's only because of the parents who have come into your world and have looked upon you as the one who requires the adoption. You need to be adopted. You need to have belonging as an individual. And he reaches and she reaches out and she says, I choose you. I choose you, sir. I choose you, ma'am. This is the picture of God himself as he reaches out and he says, Mark, I see you in your brokenness. I see you in your distorted expression of society and humanity. I choose you, Mark, to be my son. I choose you, Megan, to be my daughter. It's a beautiful picture as I move from not being wanted, rejected, betrayed to a place of belonging. The Romans 8 text rings true in this for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. No, 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 no longer do you have to know, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. God has come and he says, I choose you. I choose you. I choose you. Isn't there a beautiful song about this? And I am chosen not forsaken. I am who you say I am. I have to check. What's the next lyrics again? But the chorus says, Whom the Son sets free, 
Oh, is free indeed. I'm a. Yes, I am. You're a child of God. You've been chosen. Yeah? <laughs> we are children of God. I'm obedient to this truth. Why? Because I'm a child of God. Is there sin? Yeah. Does sin bring shame? No. No. Because that doesn't define me. I'm a child of God. I've been accepted. I've been redeemed. Yeah, but you're nobody. You were left on the street. You were rejected. No one wanted you. Yeah, that's true. That's what sin says. But right here, I'm obedient to a truth that I've been adopted into a family. That there is a father who loves me and he has called me by name. And that's why I find myself in a place of security and strength. So in his return, I'm able to confidently stand and know that I'm his. It's a powerful, powerful truth that rings true to us. Number two and the last one is this. The power of the cross destroyed the works of the devil. We need to be obedient to that truth. Sin would say no. Sin would say, you are still under the curse, Mark, and I have to stand and say, hold on, the cross has destroyed it all. There's a truth about this that I stand with that brings me confidence. We carry on in verse 4. It says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sin. Beautiful. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. When you look around you and you see the, the products of sin, he is saying to his listeners, he's saying, do not believe that as the truth of this is what it is. This is what we just have to accept. Why? Because there's a righteousness that has come through the cross. And because of that righteousness, there is a better way. There is a better way to conduct your life. There is a better way to raise your children. There is a better way to conduct yourselves with your friends out for a night out. There is a better way. Why? Because those who are in Him, those who find themselves anchored in Him, those who give of themselves to righteousness, do not give themselves to lawlessness. The power of the cross has destroyed the work of the devil. Even though there is this potential lie that sin brings that says, Mark, it is okay to be able to watch those kind of movies. No, it's not. Why? Because when I stand before Him, I do not want to stand in shame. Why? Because there is something of a destroying of the work of the enemy that I stand with holiness and purity and righteousness because of what He did for me on the cross. That God's people would be reminded again that sin would come to derail and unravel and to water down and to bring us to a point where we are giving ourselves to some form of Christianity, but yet denying the power of what Christ did on the cross for you and I so that we would stand secure in who He is, not because we have the ability to do anything, but to surrender our lives to the fact that because of Him, dying on the cross for me, destroying the works of the devil, I can stand as a man without any shame, secure in this one thing, that I stand, God, before you righteous, righteous, God, because I've abided in you. I found myself in you. In him there is no sin. 
Jesus is the only one qualified to stand undefeated, undefeated in this arena of sin. And it's because of Him that we are able to stand with a confidence because we have given ourselves to Him. He is counted worthy to step up to the plate and to address the sin that has rotted away the fiber of humanity. It is only Him. And that's where we find courage. Not because we can do it. We've read already that there's, sin has just been prolific in, in humanity since the beginning through one man, but yet through another man, a champion of sin, Jesus Christ. He conquers sin and death on the cross. And it's because we give our lives to Him, we surrender our hearts, we surrender our all to Him. We're obedient to His call to surrendering. It's because of that we're able to overcome sin and the power that maybe it might have had over us. When Jesus appeared, He appeared to get rid of sin. When Jesus appeared, He appeared to abolish the devil's ways. I love Romans 8 verse 1 in the message. It says, with the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, that fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. No longer. A new power is in operation. Woo! A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a fated lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. Isn't that beautiful? Our conquering King, Jesus, who comes and who clears and draws back the darkness. He draws back the clouds and we're able to see the light again. Why? Because, man, we are living for eternity. You and I, we are sons and daughters of the Most High. You and I have found victory, not in our own brute strength, but because our trust is in the champion, Jesus who stood before sin and death and conquered it all. And John is, like any good father, he is encouraging his children to put practices in place. He's saying, man, you need to practice righteousness because he's alluding to the fact that there are some who are practicing unrighteousness. You need to practice righteousness. Research shows that on, it takes on average about 66 days to form a new habit. I don't know how many of us have tried that. Apparently it's a thing. You can be given all the stats, all the information, but it's until you start to practice and put those things into place do you find the life of what that brings. And I want to encourage us, just as I believe John was encouraging those to say, would you be obedient to these core values, these core disciplines, to overcome sin, and, and they're really basic, but they're really important, and I want to encourage us with them. It's these things of prayer. Why don't you spend the next 66 days waking up at a specific time and just spending time praying? Or maybe reading your Bible. When last did you read your Bible? When last did we open up God's Word? Not here on Sundays, outside of Sundays. When last do we worship? And you might say, well, you know, I put on my CD. No, worship is a posture of heart. It's not necessarily singing. Worship is your giving of yourself to God. Saying, God, I, I give my life to you. I surrender. I, I exalt you. I glorify you. I magnify you. I put you first. And even the discipline of gathering with the saints, it requires a discipline approach. When the power of the cross is lived out through our lives, day in and day out, our lives become the testimony of the love, of our love for God, of our love for God. I'm obedient to this truth that Jesus conquered it all because the cross has done it all. I'll just call up the musicians just as we end off. John ends off this last two verses by raising the flag on our identity in God and the work of the cross. It's like verse 9 and 10 pretty much just sums it up. 
He in a sense says, hey, this is so important, but I just want to highlight these last two verses again. And I want to read it for us. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. Isn't that beautiful? It's like there's the seed of heaven inside of me, inside of you. There is a seed that as it grows, it grows into something that is righteous. It's beautiful. It is holy. There's a God seed that abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. And you love that? I can't keep, can you imagine if that was us. Just can't keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. It's quite a weighty way to end off a meeting. John makes it very clear that sin is a form of denying that we know God. But I want to remind us that this does not mean that we can somehow attain sinless perfection on our own. But that we should have lives that constantly seek to abandon sin. The good news of the gospel is clear that we do not earn salvation. It's not about my own abilities and my own strength, but our lives become transformed never to be the same again as we recognize that we are children of God. That's the beauty of this. Our obedience, as John would have called those little ones to be obedient to his instruction, it's only there because he's trying to bring security back into their homes, into their lives, to a place where they can overcome this brokenness of sin in their lives. I'd love for us to stand as we respond.